So do you remember where you were the very first time that you heard Silverchair? That incredible wall of noise made by three teenagers from Newcastle who went across the seas to take on the world. From jamming in a suburban bedroom in Newcastle to absolutely crushing it in front of 250,000 people at Rock in Rio and all points in between. Five incredible albums which span a musical journey from brute force grunge all the way through to lavishly intricate orchestral adventures that have musical subtleties that land on your eardrums like the feet of a butterfly. These three guys, Ben, Chris and Dan, they were more than a band. They were the very best of friends. The pressures that they were under when they were still just kids, were immense, touring the world, needing security guards with them everywhere they went, dealing with stalkers of the most insidious kind. At one point, those pressures came for all of them in one form or another. Unfortunately, those very pressures of their success eventually led to them no longer being a band. And in 2011, they announced an indefinite hiatus. But what makes a band special? When someone who's the main singer-songwriter goes solo, to be honest, it's rare that their work outside of that core creative environment is ever as good. Freddie Mercury released two solo albums. You can't name one of the songs that wasn't an Olympic theme song. But I'll, I'll bet you can name at least three Queen songs. Yeah. There's something about that creative environment of a band into which something really special flows. Each member of the band contributes in their own way to add to the final product. Some of the things are musical. Some of those things are intangible. Before Liam from The Prodigy let Keith Flint sing on Firestarter, Keith just danced. (laughs) The band would not have been the band without him. First time I saw them, Keith just danced. It was amazing. Ben Gillies and Chris Joannou are the drummer and bass player from Silverchair, and they join me on today's show. They've chosen this point in time to write a book together about their journey with the band. The book is called Love and Pain. It's a superb read. It's core. It's a story. It's a story about friendship. Unbelievable friendship. Three mates who formed a nucleus that just protected each other, served each other, helped each other survive what would have otherwise been impossible to navigate. For each of them, there's only two other people in the world who know what it was like to do what they did. But what does it feel like when one of your closest mates in the world starts to withdraw more and more from the band, from you, and from the world? What happens when alcohol and drugs start to play havoc with your ability to maintain a friendship that has otherwise been a foundation that you can always rely on? Today, Ben Gillies and Chris Joannou join me here in the studio to put it all on the table. The highs, the lows, the addiction, the sickness, the near-death experiences. It's an extraordinary conversation. To have been witness to the incredible career that these men have had is one thing that I hold very dearly. To have played a tiny, teeny, itty bitty part in that career is a true honor. But to see these two guys together just the other day, sitting here as the closest of mates after everything they've been through, is hands down one of the most inspiring and moving moments of my career. To have what those guys have with each other, I would wish for anybody as far as the quality and depth of a friendship to go through your life with. It, it was, it's amazing and you'll hear it. It's incredible. It was an honor to host them for this conversation. And I'm, I'm just so glad that you get to be a part of it. This is Ben Gillies and Chris Joannou. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> thanks for having us. This is actually a cool little. I like this little set. It's, it's got a vibe. It, it's got a definite vibe. It's good. I'm, well, I'm glad you're here. I've got a question for you. I've got an answer, Pen. <laughs> how how did it go from Andrew G to Osha? Ah, I've never been known by my own name, right? 
And both my parents changed their names. Right. I anglicized them like many immigrants did. Yep. I'm an immigrant, but I'm white. No one cares. When I was in radio, I started in radio when I was 20, just after I finished playing in bands. Right. Which is when I first met you, but I don't know if you remember it. And you were originally in Brisbane, weren't you? It was in Brisbane, yeah. yeah. And I, I, saw, I, I saw it the Annandale on the. On the no, 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 no. Oh, that was fun. You saw me that gig? I did see it. Fuck gig. off. You were at that gig? I was at that gig. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a fucking good gig. It was a good gig. <laughs> I've got to get that double bass back, actually. Um, yeah, and so I'd been known by nicknames my whole life at school and then in radio. It was in the radio in the 90s. You had like radio nicknames stick to you like shit to a blanket, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, we saw Ugly Phil just before. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> we did actually. And so, exactly. So when I went to, when I went to uh, radio in Adelaide, finally I got a sh job with the sun up. I'm like, oh, I want to get named, you know, Andrew Ginsberg. He's like, it's pretty Jewish. <laughs> Andrew G. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. And then- I was in a different country and it was a way of um, putting a difference between drinking me and not drinking me. Mm. Right. Drinking and using me and not drinking and using me. Yep. And, you know, in the same way that the moment someone called you dad, that changed who you were to yeah. that person and it changed how you thought about how fast you go on a motorbike or, mm. or you know, I'm going to go do this fucking thing tonight. It's like, actually, you know, maybe I won't change that. Because yeah, it's yeah, yeah. the idea of nominative determinism, right? So it did start. There was a there was a bloke. There was star charts. There was all that shit when it started. And I was kind of, I was like, okay. Then. But now when I look back at that, I think it had, it's less to do with that and it's more to do with um, I was able, I, it was easy because I was living in a different country and I just introduced myself as Austrian. People go, okay, all right. And I was able to live into that mm. person and then that's the person I am. Yeah. So there, yeah. does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's pretty much that. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I was thinking of, of when I, when I first, when I first met you guys, it was at the zoo in Brisbane in the Valley. Oh yeah. Was Magic Dirt supporting? Oh no, it was, was one of the way early... before that. I think it was just, just, just after SBS. Were we playing? You played. We supported you. Yeah, right. Oh, we wow. supported you upstairs at the zoo. I remember I remember playing the zoo. Mm. Yeah, it was that good. It was definitely- I was made the flyer. I made it with Texter and old bits of a Judge Dredd comic that I cut up and then I photocopied oh, cool. it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was literally, it really was a zoo. Or so. Yeah, it was- It was nuts. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember wow. uh, the moment of that was you were being- Because we were one of the three bands that Sony was courting while they were looking for their powder finger. Right. Uh they ended up going with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and rightly so. <laughs> but I remember I, re I remember that when you guys got that deal, I remember how, like, fuck, I was <laughs> yeah. well, We killed that gig. I was like, how come it was those guys? And I was like, it was because they were better. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. It feels like another lifetime ago. Yeah, well, it was. Yeah. It was nearly 30 years ago. Mm. Um and I was doing push-ups before that gig. I remember doing <laughs> push up. I was doing push-ups before that show because I was like, here we go. It was rad fun. It was so fucking cool. And I remember watching you guys play. It was so amazing uh, to see – because when I grew up, there was no one who was of that age writing their own songs. We weren't allowed to. It was like you had to play people's songs. You had yeah. to play covers if yeah. you had any legitimacy. And you guys show up going, well, fuck it, we'll write our own songs. Mm. Yeah. Did, did we, did you just gave yourself permission to do it. Well, I think we were just. Well, I think we were just curious about it. We just had a curiosity. Yeah. You know, I remember one of the first an songs, itch. Had, an itch, a little itch that needed to be scratched. Yeah. Um, I remember one of the first songs called "I Felt Like It," and it was literally like E A A D D A A. <laughs> the classics. And, yeah, the classics. You know, Gloria. You know, it works. Uh, yeah, and even before I was in the band, when it was just Ben and Dan, like I remember even in year. Four, Four or five? You three, I think. Or you four, like yeah. Lunchtime concerts. Yes. And there was already, you know, um, there was your, a own, your own material. Yeah. We were, um, when Dan and I first met, Dan had a couple of rap songs he'd, he'd already written. And then he and I started, we did a couple together. And then mm. we, um, I think this might be in the book, actually. The denim jackets. Don't, yeah, the denim yeah. jackets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, yeah. we used, the, uh, we used the, the desks as our stage and got up there and swung around our heads and sung rap songs to the, the demo button on the, 
the school keyboard and you know so it definitely started from a from Cassio. an early age you started a yeah. thousand million <laughs> everyone says roland with the 808 and the 303 and all that business well, Cassio. Yeah, Cassio, demo Cassio, Cassio demo button Cassio demo button it's all you need <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's> it. <laughs> yeah. there, but there was always a samba option too boom <laughs> boom yeah. 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 It was fun though. It was great. It, fun. It, well, it, it, I think I think those keyboards were, was part of the discovery. Yeah, you know, it, I didn't know what, what a bossa nova was, and there was a bossa nova button. You hit it, and you go, "Oh, cool! Yeah, that's I that can, one. I can I can download that. I know yeah. what it is." Now. They're not playing that on Star FM. They're not playing no, on FM no. four. You don't hear it bossing over in Brisbane. But <laughs> samba is now suddenly in my life because I push a button, and there it is. Mm. It's like that's a cool beat. That's yeah, not yeah. one three one three, <laughs> which was. You know everything else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's right. There was Australians clap on the one and the three. It's sometimes like there it's was not a time. Right. It's not right. No, no. Yeah. But you look at old TV shows. Come on, Aussie, come on, yeah. come on. That it's no. so terrifying. It's awkward. Yeah. yeah, it's extraordinarily fortunate that I have had this kind of wild career and a parallel of being able to observe you doing what you're doing mm. over the course of your life. And it's just amazing to listen to the book. I listen, uh, look, the way my brain works, I do a thing on my phone and I get it to read the screen to me. Uh, and yeah. Then, so uh, Siri read the whole thing to me. I, I did a similar thing during the during the process of the editing process and going through I discovered a program called Speechify. Amazing. And I think I, I think I read we must have read it maybe six times. And then in the in the 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 final hour I was like, I just need I a couple this more. more I, need a, I need a couple more run throughs. And I think it nearly made my brain melt because I, I, I listened to it like double the speed, and you, you, you can you really can intake the information. I think if you if you read along with it, and by the end I was like oh, I'm I'm cooked. so I'm so cooked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was up to maybe number eight at that point, but yeah, it's a good it's a good way to read it, right? You, yeah. it almost takes a lot of the thought out of it, but you still. Digesting oh, it's just, it. It's just the way my head works. If school was in an audio format, I would have nailed it. <laughs> it's, the, it's the reading part. Yeah, reading the same sentence three it, times. It, like, oh, oh, oh. Dude, <laughs> I know. I don't know, it just reminds me, I haven't taken my ADHD meds this morning. Sorry. Uh, I might ramble. I, I apologize. The thing, ramble that, on. the thing that got me a lot about this book, and, and it, it just really struck me how you were able to put into words the friendship that is at the core. Of what mm. made your band your band? Well, I'm I'm glad you that noticed that. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, um, there was one conversation we we're having this morning, and we were talking about the book. But a lot of people do get um, heavily focused in on the band era. But essentially, Ben and I have known each other for 43 years, so 14 years or 13 years before the band started, and about the same after post, post the band, um, and you know, experienced some super big highs and some difficult times as well, um, but we're still really good mates. And, and you don't get that in life. No. There, It's so rare yeah. to say you've known someone for that long. And and, ha and had those experiences mm, yeah. as well. Um, and not just the band, but all, yeah, all the, all the other kind of just life stuff that I think we all experience. Like we've kind of been through it all. Like he finishes my sentences and things. It's yeah, really it's all nice. very cute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a, a there was a particular moment uh, as you know. I as I said to you before, I'm in recovery. I'm like nearly thirteen and a half years, mm. and you spoke quite openly about um, a, a moment where you make an amends. Mm. Yes. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, what was happening before that there was a kind of a distant kind of space between the two of you i think a lot of it was substance related um i had an alcohol problem you know i guess that one th i'm i am an alcoholic you know and mate I, we are the majority in this room right now i'll tell you that <laughs> <laughs> two out of three right here so i guess uh i we both talk about our personal journeys and i, th I just felt like that was quite a um, significant part of my life mm. where I, I really battled with it. But once I stopped drinking, um, and I went to a couple of AA sessions, so it didn't really work for me, but I definitely, one thing I took away from it was that having to, um, mend 
the relationships that may have suffered because of the, the, the addiction or the substance abuse. And Chris was such an important part of my life and we had drifted apart. And for me, from where, from my perspective, it had a lot to do with drinking and just, you know, making, saying some horrible things to Chris that I didn't mean and having to mend that bridge. And, um, look, it was really confronting, but it's just, I think, I think, in life, when you confront those things, there's always a gift on the other side of it. And the gift was the fact that we were able to get past it and mm. kind of rekindle out that friendship that was so important to both of us. And it yeah. was on me. I had to do it because yeah. I, I was I was in the wrong. I'd fucked up basically. Oh, mate. I know I know that all too well. Yeah. Like, and it's an ongoing process. You know, I like just because I stopped drinking and using doesn't mean I have to stop making amends. Like mm. I still fuck up yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think I think there's a real huge like when we started the process, yeah. talking about those stories as well as the band experiences, I think was important to have them in there just to sh like show It brings a lot of context. Yeah, and, and it shows that like it's it's not just like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and traveling around having these crazy stories. It's like we've we've had these other human experiences that people will relate to. Yeah, because I think ultimately most people on the planet, you know, it doesn't matter if you're having these extraordinary experiences in a band or whatever it is that people look up to and they see it on the TV or. Mm. And they hear it like those people are still having a very similar experience to you, mm. but you know maybe you don't necessarily see it. Yeah, mm. yeah. Anyone mm. listening who knows somebody who has an addiction problem, getting like shopping, sex, whatever, will have had one of those phone calls. Mm. Chris, they're like, "What? I haven't heard from that guy forever. Why does he want to meet me at a cafe? We never meet at cafes. Yeah, you know, what's it like to be on the other side of that?" Um. Look, I was all, I was all for it because you know I know the value too of what that friendship was and what we did, had experienced together. And it wasn't that there was a there were a few moments and stuff between Ben and I, and, I, and it it just needed space because it wasn't it wasn't pleasurable anymore. It wasn't yeah. enjoyable, and you know there were a lot of other um, contributing factors that were just sort of. It wasn't what it used to. It wasn't enjoyable anymore. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, we had a, you know, an hour or two catch up, and you lay it all out on the table, and it all makes complete sense. It wasn't. It wasn't like Ben was trying to make excuses. We just spoke openly about what it was and what happened, and you know, and it's really easy to move for. Like I wanted that as as much as Ben did as well. Yeah. But yeah, like we've never looked back from there. Yeah, yeah. It's, and I think that's important too. It's not. Yeah, there's no grudges. It's like, you know, it's about moving forward. And it was really generous that you guys put that in because you could have not put that in, but it's super generous that you did because mm. there's certainly in this country there's very it's starting to change, and this I think will be a big part of that is like kind of demonstrating that process of like as you just mentioned, yeah we might be these guys on stage doing this thing, but we're going through the same bits of life that everybody else is. Yeah. There's an amplification factor, but you know, as well as I do, like I've met people that aren't in my game. Well, certainly when I was at my peak kind of <laughs> chaos mode, they're just blokes that own a ute and do tradey stuff. And they're like, oh, I'm like, fuck, Jesus Christ. Like they're like <laughs> full, like kind of better yeah. than any backstage thing I've ever seen as their general Friday night. Yeah. You know, so it's not, doesn't discriminate. No. no. It comes for anybody that, anywhere. That's right, yeah. yeah. We only hear about the people that play footy or are in music or actors or whatever yeah. because they're the people of profile, but it's, yeah. it's everywhere. Yeah. And the opportunity to see what can happen to a, a friendship or a relationship after mm. that. Well, you know, we're- It's important. Social creatures and, yeah. you know, like we thrive on relationships and friendships and they enrich your life, you know. They, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's wild listening to, because there was <laughs> there's a bit of stuff made in the book and this is the part where our history is kind of the Venn diagram comes like this. Because I remember a night at the Grafton in LA. Oh, yeah. Oh, that place. <laughs> oh, that, that yeah, the Grafton's dangerous. <laughs> so I remember that and it was around that kind of Jay Leno appearance yep. that you know yeah and i was like fucking christ please let it not have been the night before <laughs> well there was more than one so <laughs> okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was like it definitely reached a tipping point yeah of, yeah just 
excess. And I don't know if that's just part of that snowball effect or hey. everyone was <laughs> kind of um, <laughs> looking for... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how it just it just escalated. Yeah, yeah. I understand. It makes complete sense, you know, because you just had two hundred fifty fucking thousand people scream your name and sing your songs back to you. What next? Mm. Yeah, you know what happens now? Yeah, balance is a yeah a interesting it's, concept. It is yeah. in amidst all that. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I got and I've talked about this when I got cleaner cleaning when i got clean i would go to these meetings i'd be like yeah but and then i got sent to this meeting on on sunset uh because i was living in america at the time and i sat there and i was like all oh, right well i've camped out for your tickets and i own all your cds i've interviewed you interviewed you three times and and people would say exactly that they would speak about their experience I'm like all oh, right yeah okay yeah this is this is what i get mm. now okay how do you do that? Because I know that. I know that feeling. I know what it is to get off stage or whatever at 11 at night and be like, okay, yeah. what now? I yeah. am literally Bedtime, everybody. doing 9,000 <laughs> revs a minute. Yeah. 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 Because that's what it takes to do the job. Yeah. What happens for the next seven hours? Mm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Trying, to, trying to pump the brakes. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's oh, man, it's, it's, it's important, man. It's really important. You grew up in a, has has been revealed history of your band that has come out, you know, from reading this book and other things that have come out. There's some stuff, like some public attention, stalky stuff that I don't, I certainly wasn't aware of. Mm. And th I know, if, you know, that's scary as shit when that starts to happen when you're a kid. So mm. it's like another, another fucking level. What, yeah. was it, what was it like? Were you aware of how intense that was? Um. Early days, I think there was a, an element of blissfully unaware. Um, you know, there was there's definitely one in particular riding to school with Dan one morning and, you, you know, finally having a photographer. That, you're at that point where there's someone following you to take photos. You're and, just on a pushy on the way to school. Yeah. 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 School uniform. Yeah, I'll and, just be um, taking photos of children that aren't mine. Yeah. Riding to school, this yeah. is fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it no, was, it's not. It was a, a ride to school safely campaign, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you um, being heroes with your own helmets? Uh, probably hanging off the handlebars. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Try, That's no, the safest place for it. Trying, yeah, to, make an trying to make an example of us. <laughs> um, but <laughs> it's like know, the game the yeah, <clears throat> There's no denying Dan definitely experienced. Um, uh, probably a more intense um, moment through a lot of that. Yeah. Um, but I guess, yeah, essentially we're all on the same wave. Um, yeah, and you, you sort of, once it was rolling, you either found ways to find comfort in where where your little sanctuary was or mm. tried to cope with it as best you could really. Yeah. You're both parents now mm. as you uh, – happens to all of us. You look at your own kids and go, oh, fuck. And you sort of, a lot of things come to mind yep. of you, what you did. Like the, you guys talking about, you know, the mum tour or the dad tour, mm. you know. When you're yeah. like, <laughs> uh, now that you both, you know, have the responsibility for this kind of helpless human, no matter yes. how big they get, they're still that little child that couldn't feed or clothes mm. or look after themselves. Does it make you think any differently about what your folks were trying to do for you at that time? Hugely. Yeah, it makes you appreciate maybe how how generous they were to let us follow our dreams, you know, because we were yeah. so young. Um, how scary that might, might have been for yeah, them. Yeah, I looked, there's a photo in the book. Um, I think it's the one we're on the plane or somewhere, but looking at heaps of other stuff recently and it just dawned on me, like our parents were kind of our age now touring the world with their sons in a band. And I just think, how the heck? Like, how do you my navigate head would explode. That? Yeah. And, like, I was like, oh, God, that would just be. Well, it's like, what? yeah, you consider, like, what am I allowing my child to take part in? Like, because I guess the, the, the stigma of the music industry is sex, drugs, and rock and roll and wild parties. And I don't think that's entirely true. Like it is hard work and, but that there, there that, that element is definitely mixed into it. Um, so for them to be, 
semi aware of that and to allow us to do it, you know, you can't, you got to take your hat mm. off to them because I think ultimately they knew that we were in love with the music. I think if we were chasing going like, we just want to be famous, we want to be, I think if that was our motivation, maybe they would have been a little bit more hesitant. But the fact that we were like, that I think they could tell that we were just, mm. just so keen to be musicians and, and play and record and create, you know, maybe that made it easier for them to be able to go, well, I'm not going to, I don't want to have a regret if I deny my child to follow their dreams in 10 or 20 years where they go, why didn't you let me do that? Because that was my passion and that's what I love to do. So, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean yeah. they weren't bloody nervous. But plus, we don't, we <laughs> don't know what we know now either. So yeah, the, every step of the way back then was just kind of, it, there was excitement and nervous energy probably on their part, but just pure excitement for us. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, it was just one foot in front of the other. And let's face it, they I think they got a kick out of it too. Yeah. Like, I, you yeah, know. Yeah, travelling the world. Yeah. And, I mean, my, my dad would always like, you know, we'd be sitting there just chatting and he'd just bring up randomly like, oh, do you remember this and do you remember that? Like remember it was it? yesterday. Like, like it was yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm struggling around. Like, dad, that was 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I have a memory. I think it was possibly the, the most drunk I've ever been in my life. There's a rule in New Orleans, and this is, this is, it touches on this in the book. You, you, there's, a grenade, there's a drink called the Grenade on, on Bourbon Street in New Orleans, and you really only should have one grenade. I had several grenades. I went out with a couple of the guys from uh, our, t- our tutor and a guitar tech from another band. Anyway, I got absolutely poleaxed, and it was a dad's tour. And uh, I think it was possibly the most drunk I've ever been in my life. And I remember waking up and looking around and going, I have no idea where I could be in a gutter. I could be, I don't know. I don't know how I got here. I've completely blacked out. Anyway, the next minute I just heard dad snoring. And it was like, the yes, mo- yeah, it was I'm like, in the hotel room. Like, usually I hated hearing my dad snoring on the dad's tour. It would drive me crazy. But it was the, it was the time to- when I heard it, it was like angels. A big blanket. It was like I a was big like, blanket. Oh, safety. <laughs> dad's here. I don't know how I got here, but dad's right there. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That sounds, yeah. that's, that's terrifying. Fuck me. It's, it- it's interesting hearing you say that, you know. Sorry to circle back to the, the the drinking thing, but I thought you covered it really, really well because you explained what it what it is in a way that I I really related to. You mentioned the kind of two point five drinks kind of feeling. Mm. Yeah, you know? that's what that's and kind that, of what you chase. You know, and it was that being that maggot is what ended up every time in the end for me. But it was that I just need to find that. Get yeah, it, where is it? Where is it? Spot. It's one yeah. beer away. If I can sit there, there. I can, yeah. I can, if I can just go, oh, just maybe a bit of this, a bit of that. <laughs> like, well, yeah. It was never, ever there. I never held it, but I was always racing after yeah, it. So and everything just got worse and fucking worse and worse and worse and worse. And I thought you described that in a way that, well, hopefully a lot of people can go, oh yeah. Mm. Actually, I get it. Now I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. I don't actually get better at pool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, like, you think you do. Yeah. <laughs> you think you get better at everything, but and you a just get dancer, worse. Dancer, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe dancing. Maybe yeah. that's the only <laughs> exception. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brave thing to to write what you because of who you who you are to people and what you mean to people. And mm. you, you know, it was a it was a moment you were the you know it's like anything. You were the right guys in the right band at the right time playing the right music. In a radio network that's just gone national with something like Triple J, people mm-hmm. looking for, you know, you were just those guys. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure there were other bands around you that worked as hard and wrote as many songs. Oh, but no doubt. There was a certain, I think, I, I do think, um, it's, it, I think we've got enough perspective now, but it, it's hard when you're in a band, but I do think that Silverchair just had a, a certain magic about it. Yeah. There was a chemistry, and but when the three of us played together that, well, that was our, again. That was our reality. That's all we knew. Yeah. But it wasn't until after the we stopped playing as a band that uh, I mean, I played with some other musicians that mm-hmm. I realised like just how special the three when the three of us came together and played. I don't know how or why, but the sum of all of the parts just it was there was just a it's special a thing, magic yeah. spark. Same. Like that's a big part of the reason why I haven't really 
well, I've done nothing musically. I did a few projects, same thing after, did a bit of producing, but it just never, it never got to that feeling moment. Yeah. Yeah. That unspoken kind of thing that jazz guys talk about where they just know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's a real. We had a knowing where when the three of us came together, there was some kind of like, uh, I, you can't, you put your finger on it. Mm. It's, it is that X factor. Yeah, you know, right. where you go, I don't know why it is that when we play together that it just creates something extra special. Yeah. You know? Even after those extended breaks in between records or even if there'd been 12 months of not playing and we jumped in and did a show or something. Um, you'd forget. By and the end of the first day back in rehearsals, you'd be like, oh, it's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> How good is this? <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you're waiting all week to get back to that sort of match fitness element again. It was just by the end of the first day, it'd always be going, Fuck. This is was a reminder how just how, it's like that, how good it was. You yeah. become a together. social surfer, like you know, sporadically surfed over the years, and like you don't surf for like five years, and you go and pat on the wave, and you're like, "What have I been doing? This yeah, is this awesome!" Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that can really pull a band apart, unfortunately, is the money. And I, um, one of my favorite bands ever when I was a kid. Some of the stuff doesn't date very well. Uh, Van Halen, mm-hmm. they were amazing. And I remember reading an interview with Michael Anthony, the bass player, first you first, got two first names, yeah. um, just talking about, yeah, they really take care of me. Basically, because they they kind of early decided early on, it's going to be a four-way split. Mm. Eddie writes everything, yeah. but it's a four-way split because, you know, that that's they kind of figured out, like, because the way that, it works for people listening. Um, there's music, there's lyrics, and then there's there's two parts of getting paid. There's publishing uh, royalties, yeah. and then there's you know performance. And um, there's a famous, my favourite story. When I was at, I went to music school or TAFE, and there was a <laughs> we did TAFE too, man. It's all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I did. Yeah. I did mine in, in Brisbane with contemporary music. Yeah. Yeah. Take a course, take a TAFE course in something you're already quite good at. Yeah. Got me into uni. It was, pretty, it was pretty yeah. good. Because um, they were explaining publishing, they were explaining royalties and the business of it. And they told this Skyhook story where they were show, it was after the first, after Living in the 70s came out, and they show up to rehearsal and Greg, the bass player, shows up in a 911 Porsche and Shirley Strawn's still driving his VW Beetle. <laughs> and he goes to the manager, he's like, what the, what the fuck's going on here? And he goes, yeah, but he writes the songs. Yeah, but I'll sing them. It's like, yeah, mm. but he writes the songs. And that was the conversation around how, you know, what you're publishing. Mm-hmm. When that stuff started to play a role and you started to see where things were going, did that exacerbate things? Did it make things difficult? Um, I guess w- years ago, probably not so much. But I, I think as the years did tick on, it, yeah, there was definitely um, – I guess, moments of of reflection of how things may have been structured and, um, but, I mean, and it's also been very different for me. Essentially, I've never been a songwriter within the band um, directly, but, um, yeah, so that sort of emotional journey has been a little different for Ben, but, yeah, I mean, reflecting on it, I think... Everyone was probably making decisions in the moment that might have felt best for the individual at the time, and rather than the collective. Yeah, yep. Um, and now, subsequently, years later, it probably um, might be a few moments that are a little harder to swallow. But um, yeah, that's what happened, <laughs> and that's what it is. I think there's it, it does touch on in the book that uh, a lot of bands that do just split everything equally, uh, famously, they stay together longer, they're more successful, they have more hits, they have, uh, I think they've won more Grammys, um, you know, and I think it's, uh, you, you know, you need to look at the band as the, you can have a main kind of creator, but, you know, I think through the process, particularly the silver chair, we call it the silver chair filter, you know, I th- we all contribute to those songs, like um, you know, on it from a structural point of view, and then putting our own kind of personal signatures on there. Like for for myself, like rhythmically, I mm. think there's a very much a personal signature on those songs, and then also like the 
the promotion you know, like, and using the the vehicle of the band to actually get them out into the world, I think that's an important something to 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 recognise. And you know, I think that's why it is important that if if we had the time again, that it, you know, and we know if we knew what we knew now, you might say, well, I think the fair way to do this is is to split it equally. Um, but you know, that's that's not how that's not how it happened, and it doesn't it doesn't matter. It's interesting how it does play into dynamics. Yeah, and definitely. Yeah, I think at the time, I think people were just genuinely trying to make the best decisions yeah. for their, you know, respective, yeah. um, respective but, children. Yeah, rather than as a as a whole. Right. But you know, again, again, I think it was just. Our, uh, I think a lot of that had to do with their parents doing what they thought was right at the time. Mm. Yeah. Um, and they, yeah, they were they were looking at yeah very much from an individual point of view rather than a band as a whole and the longevity of the band. Mm. But you know maybe they they just they didn't know that either. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you that's know? right. I think as a parent you do you look out for your own yeah. kid. Yeah, and that's normal. Yeah, I wonder I wonder if like from here where because the, the music industry is very different now. No mm. one's you don't sell a record. You but the old you'd give away a concert ticket to get an album sale, mm. now you give away an album to get a, get a yeah, ticket sale. It has yep. flipped, yeah. You know, the, f- al- the music's free, unfortunately. Yeah. The, the units don't cost anything, but th- that's why people pay 400 bucks to go see a show. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Cool, yeah. Isn't like, it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> planes yeah. are expensive. 15 <laughs> hotel rooms on a small tour is hard. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's a lot of Taragos or yeah. whatever the yeah. star is. I don't know what it even is called now. Like, it's a lot of minivans. Yeah. Um, and the productions are getting like, yeah. you, you go and yeah, see some of those elaborate. productions and they're huge. Yeah. You know, it's just, I I want, so I wonder if, you know, the music industry can learn from the way, for example, that startups or tech startups are founded, you know, where the, the person who's the, I don't know, the, the, the chief coding person mm. you know she might not have had the inception of the idea but she's there and she's got shares vested and like the thing only exists because she it wasn't her concept but she's the one that broke the code mm. that ended up making the thing work and then you know what i mean like and then depending on how big the thing gets because yeah. she was a part of that first few months of it or first years of it yeah you know you know what i mean like yeah, maybe yeah like i wonder if that's looking at it largely like that it seems it seems like such an antiquated way of getting musicians paid um I'd love to see a change in that because without people getting paid, no one's going to want to write music. You know, no one's going to want to write their next favourite songs. Yeah. And it's all going to come from other countries, unfortunately, mm. because mm. Australians can't afford to do it, which mm. sucks. Yeah. Really fucking yeah, it's, sucks. It's, yeah. You know, it's real hard. Like, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't start now. Would, no way. It'd be, yeah. it'd be, yeah, I can't imagine what it would be like being a new artist now. Like it would be starting from the ground up. It would be really challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I much yeah. prefer the 90s. 90s <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you're still selling a physical thing. You know, you were you were selling a physical thing. You had merch money in a Ziploc bag. Yeah. yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I don't know. What are you talking about? Talking about? Uh, oh, boy. The stories of it. There's three of you in the band. And the friendship that's at the core of the of the band that makes the music what it is and makes those moments together in the jam room so special, that unspoken thing that, you know, built for years before mm. any of you were in the room together that you yeah. could then draw upon once you learn how to communicate with music. Um, what's that like when one of those people starts to kind of pull back? And what's it like when you see that person kind of struggling with their health? There's a lot of interesting, um, I guess, life experiences that the three of us have shared, some probably a little more intense than others, some... You know, there were moments that Ben went through that I had absolutely no idea, yet we were around each other like 24-7 for bulk periods of those years. Um, So, yes, I guess some things are held a little bit more privately. Um, But, um, you know, in a sense of like Dan moving out and doing other creative things. I mean, that was happening early on in the piece with, you know, Can't Believe It's Not Rock and, um, you know, Dissociatives and um, other projects that were coming up. So it wasn't essentially a new concept, but it was, for me personally, at times difficult to um, have to come to terms with this thing being the band um, yes, yeah, slowly breaking down and not 
really like its future looking a little sort of bleak. And so that was a pretty difficult thing for me personally to resolve. And it's it's taken a number of years and still I don't feel totally comfortable with it, at ease, I should say. Yeah. I'm, it's better. The book was a great process to sort of yeah. recognise so many insane things and how great it was. And, you know, there, there's a few ugly moments that, you know, we, we experienced and are comfortable to talk about them. But, um, yeah, the book was definitely a moment of, I don't want to say healing, but um, just it helped me move forward a bit. You can process them as an adult now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. A few more skills. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you've got a bit more perspective, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's been a big thing for me. Yeah. 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 I play bass. Mm. That's where I am with you. Mm. Uh, I have also smoked enough weed that I thought the fucking world was ending, even when I wasn't high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and when you write about that, I was like, Jesus, fuck. I thought I was some special snowflake. No. <laughs> like, yeah, the way you described that, the way you described how, and it was hydroponic Adelaide weed, um, how that kind of was probably already all going on, but yeah. I Jimi Hendrix Zippo flew into that thing and I just hit go and, yeah, everything went. Hearing you talk about that, and the work that it takes to come around that and work through that, with that perspective and what's going on, when you think about your friend Dan, like, how's that feel, man? With the perspective, I think, and as you age and as you have more experience and as you have kids, um, I guess you just look at the world differently, right? And you realise that every single person is having their own journey um, and we try and relate to each other as much as we possibly can to kind of make that journey not feel so scary and that, that you're not alone. And for me, that was a really important part of being so open and honest about the experiences during the band and before and after. Just so if there are any Silverchair fans out there that see this extraordinary experience that we've had, that they can kind of grab onto those things and go, oh, good, I don't feel alone or I don't feel like I'm you know, having, I don't, you know, I don't feel weird or whatever, like these guys that I looked up to or whatever it was, they were, they were having their, this kind of struggle as well as I was. And, you know, I, th I think Dan's the same. I think, you know, he's had his struggles and I guess it's just, it's, it's how you deal with them. You know, I always felt like that if I, over time, I felt like that if I confront them head on, as scary as it is, that on the other side, there's always a gift. It's like, like I said with mm. Chris, you know, that like having that convers that first conversation, I'll never forget it with Chris. I was so nervous, but I was like, I've just got to, I've just got to have an idea of what I'm going to say. And, and I don't know how this is going to play out, but I've just got to do it and confront it because on the other side of it, there could be something great. And I think that goes for a lot of that mental, it's a lot of the mental health stuff, you know, it can be really scary, but if you put in the work and you're willing to, you know, even give up a substance, sometimes when you're taking a substance that's, that you're self-medicating with, that the idea of stopping it is scary because it's kind of masking whatever it is that's worrying you or mm -hmm. giving you anxiety. If you confront that, and then you come out the other side of it, you get the gift, you get that clarity and you go, oh, I'm okay and I'm going to get through it. And, um, you know, for, for me, for Chris, for Dan, for anyone that reads the book, I think that that's, that's, that's my message is to, you know, don't, it's every, everything's going to be okay in the mm. end, <laughs> but you need. I think you, you need a few years under your belt and a few a few experiences to get to that point. You know, because yeah. when you're in the when you're in the eye of the storm, when you're in the storm, like yeah, it can be scary. You know, and 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 yeah, you know, you can have these horrible experiences and feel like it's never going to end, but it it will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I'll, no, 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 no. I am. I'm afraid now, and I'm. <laughs> And I know that I, I know that every time I do this thing, I end up having like a totally green out and, and, you know, I think people are coming through my front door, but I, I'm really, I'm 
too afraid to not do it. Mm. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah, too afraid to not what, drink. Yeah, my, yeah. I'm too afraid to not have that thing, even though I know it's going to be awful. And eventually it gets so awful, like, okay, now I actually really can't do that thing. I'm yeah. just going to have to just be with this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think, um, you, you know, you got, and you, you really do need to put work into it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. You've got to be willing to put in the work. Yeah, but there's great, there's, there's great reward out of that. Yeah. You know, because you're just going to eventually destroy everything around you. Mm, yeah. You know, and I find, I find um, like, I find all, everything just blossoms. Yeah. You know, it's like once you stop the booze and once I stop, I mean, I stopped smoking marijuana a long time ago. Um, but, you know, once you stop those things, you know, some people, look, I'm not saying it's for everyone. Some people can can kind of just have a couple of drinks and they're cool with it. But for the people that do go beyond. Um, beyond the 2.5. Beyond the 2.5. <laughs> you know, it's there's just, yeah. there's a clarity that comes with with not doing it that is just so refreshing. Yeah. And Yeah. But it's, and it, the other thing you could get into with, with that stuff is like in Australia, like the stigma around it. Like when I stopped drinking, like I said to my friends, like, that's it, boys. I'm out. I'm. I, I can't do this anymore. And the 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 first reaction was like, shock, "Oh, shock hey, what, what's wrong? Are you sick? And what's is something wrong? Are and you I'm expecting? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and I was like, "No, I just don't. I can't do that anymore because it's you know it's affecting it's my right relationships it. yeah. and it's not good for me." Yeah. Um. But it's just, and even the social, um, the social adjustment because you so you get that little bit of Dutch courage and you get that yeah. you know, the, the, the twilight. You get a bit of confidence, you oh, know. Yeah. But you know, some people can eat peanut butter and die. <laughs> that's it, that's I right. yeah. can eat all the peanut butter in the world. <laughs> I'm not upset at them. You know, it's just <laughs> yeah. that's how I that's how I talk. Like if that molecule of alcohol, that's what it does to my body. Mm -hmm. Like that's eventually it's an allergy. Yeah. When I drink, I, I I break out and fuck with. That's what happens. Like, <laughs> I break out into fuck it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Other symptoms include financial ruin, divorce, and career. It's always like yeah. it's the byproducts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's you know to have each other uh, and you know to that. You know, it's even as to have you here in this space, it's fucking mm. great, man. Because the way I, you know, like I said, we we kind of orbit in, there's people that we're adjacent. I'm a few, yeah, few yeah, rings yeah. around. There's less than six uh, degrees. We're less than six degrees between us, yeah, and there has yeah. been for quite a number of years. Uh, and so when <laughs> I started hearing about the health stuff that was going on with you, I was mm. like, bro, it was so striking. And mm. I can't imagine what it was like to have that happen. Like not once but twice. Mm. Like, yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, to, yeah. I guess to, the first have, one was yeah, just to not have the structure of the band around you, to, like to not be touring, to not be mm. you know have the management structure, to not have all that happening. Mm. That must have been really hard. Yeah. Well, I guess essentially I'd replaced the band with a venue that I'd opened in Newcastle, which it sort of did fill a lot of that. Um, um, yeah. That. Um, desire that itch that i had for yeah. you know doing stuff and I, I had cancer yeah um and a very rare form at that too and that was the other frightening thing look at you you fucking special look at you fucking yeah, <laughs> super <look>. rare cancer <laughs> <laughs> what was that gag you was, oh you're so famous you yeah you had to get the rare <laughs> oh, one didn't you? oh yeah yeah, yeah. it's, a, it's a, no this is the bird of collie 5000 yeah <laughs> it's never good when they go for the textbook no it's never good when your doctor <laughs> hang on a second here and they call no I'll call a registrar yeah. no the one at Royal Brisbane they know yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, never it was kind of like that no, I do remember my <laughs> first appointment the oncologist sort of just expressing his concern and saying look oh, I, I can't help you here you'll have to well, I'm going to refer you straight on that that meeting was over and done in about 10 minutes boy um and See then six months oh god yeah so and then it, I just I don't know I just luckily well gratefully landed um under um Dr. Grimerson at uh, Lifehouse in Sydney and yeah You've been all over the world. You've seen countries that don't have the healthcare we have here. Well, and then going yeah, on to yeah. my next health episode, having a heart attack last year. Fucking <laughs> hell. Oh, no, right. Um, <laughs> and just talking about it. You're health. a fit bloke. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, well, uh, well I thought I was too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, how lucky we are in this country. Like, so uh, after my first heart attack, I was actually doing some work with Ben on the book in Newcastle and I was having some chest pains and I thought, oh, I'll just duck up to the hospital and I'll just get it looked at because it was still pretty fresh after the first one. 
and um, you know, get the blood test done. Oh yeah, your levels elevated. Blah blah blah. And like, I had another third stent put in, and literally just in twenty four hours, walked in, had a blood test. Yep, angiogram stent. Checked out, had a coffee, walked out the next morning, and Ben, ben picked me up from the hospital. It was like, <laughs> I was like, this is inc- this is we are so lucky that we have, you know. These just facilities, like a, yeah, like, it was. Oh, it's just easy. Just yeah, I'll just duck in, get another stint, and um, I'll be out yeah. in the morning. Yeah. So, what what kind of changes does that lead to your your life going forward? Because I'm sure you don't want to collect the whole set. You don't want another <laughs> one. No, definitely not. Not and, sure you how know, many like more I, you can get. Like, <laughs> is there any more space? Yeah, oh, there's one more, I think. Oh God. But, so, what what changes in your life? What 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 kind um, of things can you be in control of here? It's um, it's really just diet and exercise, um, Classic. lifestyle. Classic. Yeah, it's really what it comes down. I mean, to. there's but something I'm, to that. They do, <laughs> they do that seem does. to think that it's a combination of my chemo treatment. Yeah, right. Has accelerated some heart disease, ah. along with um, a hereditary issue. Yeah, so I sort of got a couple of things going on that. Yeah, right. I'm sort of out of my hand, out of my control. I could eat as much sauerkraut as I like, but it's not. How yeah, good sauerkraut! I love it, mate. Yeah, look, I've, cool. I've learned to love it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the wog upbringing that I yeah, have. I think. but I do, I do eat pretty good. Yeah, you know, I like to eat at nice restaurants, so that's sort of little extra hidden butter here and there. Do you go? But that's st- a treat. It's not. It's not a weekly or. Do you go straight to the menu and look for cabbage? Look, I do <laughs> – when I'm eating, I do actually – I've naturally now steered away from a lot of the big heavy red meats when I'm out. Yeah. And I'll always make sure that there is some green with every meal when I'm out. Would you go for the um, – remember, you know, the pasta with the egg through it? I think it's Ricardo's. Oh, Would, cab- Would you still go for that? Would you still go for that? Look, it's – that's a that's a really big treat if I was was yeah. going to, yeah. but only a very small amount. You don't have the big bowl that <laughs> yeah. you sort of. Do you know the password? Do you know the Do you know the password? I do. Yeah, it's yeah. been a while since I've eaten it, but I remember it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember. Yeah. I remember so there's it. definitely lots of yeah lifestyle choices that I stop and think is it worth yeah. it. When I got my diagnosis, I I guess essentially it was just. Hard. It's still kind of hard to believe that that happened. Um, and, yeah, just sh- just in total shock, Dispel- a little bit of disbelief, yeah. Um, and it still does feel like just a bit of a crazy dream. Um, but I do consider myself extremely lucky. But yeah, it's hard to explain, really. To be faced with your own mortality yeah. like well, that. Well, I do say to a lot of people, like, the only difference is I've sort of been forced to think about death. We're all the same and we're all going to die, unfortunately. We're not here forever. Um, I, that's kind of the only difference. Um, and there's lots of other people out there with illnesses and bits and pieces um, and that are very difficult um, and challenging. But I guess, yeah, I've sort of been forced to stop and just think about that moment of death and what is it, what is it and what, is, and, but then, then yeah, it shoots you down to, uh, lots of different areas of wanting to feel very resolved with things and comfortable and, you know, you don't want to be carrying any excess crap because it, life is too short, essentially. It um, becomes a fairly okay way to go through the day though. Yeah. So it sort of did catapult me in you know, a direction of just as cliche as it sounds, just sort of living in the now and not really sweating the small stuff. Um, and, yeah, it's a nice way to live. You were talking about this the other day about going, I just need to be here, make sure I'm here in the next 25 years for my kids. Yeah, that's and it. And, like, you just want to, yeah. you know, yeah, I want to be here to make sure that, they're at an age where they're established in life and on their trajectory, doing their thing. You got to get them through the um, the self discovery of the teens and then the silliness of the twenties. So once they hit, because we all did it. Once you hit, once they get to about, if you get them to thirty, then you kind of like, 
Good. <laughs> you know? I think 25 is when the prefrontal cortex finally forms. Yeah. As, yep. Right, okay. That's you, as good as it's going to get. Unless, <laughs> yeah. unless you're me and you, know, you, 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 drink, you drank holes in it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> all, all through so, its development. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, you're so right. It really changes. That. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, I had that when, and I, I say this all the time, I became a stepfather before, before Wolfie was born. And even like that was... She was, Georgia was my girlfriend's kid. Mm. And then one day I woke up and I'm like, I will do everything I can to protect you and save you. And like, I'll mm. push you out of the way of a train if it means that I die yep. because it's now all about you. It was like, wow, I'm a selfish fucker. And like, mm. now all I want to do is provide and be sure that yeah, the next- it's primal. Now I was like, oh yeah. God, I, it was next year. It was next contract. Now I'm thinking 60, mm. you know, 70. Yeah. What am I, how am I going to be making sure that money's still around yeah. for this person? Well, just to be there, you just to just to be there because as yeah. a rock for your child, yeah, it's 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 important. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to be. You know, I just want to sit around and not be able to participate. Yeah, that's and, right. You know, be a part of it. Mm. You know, you want to. You don't want to be. I, I grew up with guys who had dads who were old. They didn't leave the chair much. Mm. Like the dad chair. You know, they didn't leave the dad's chair much. <laughs> they was like that's was that a you know? I don't want that. <laughs> no. Nah. I don't want that. I want to be involved. Yeah. 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 yeah I just want to be a part of it. I want to, you know, I want to do it. You know, music's obviously a thing that is, the music's really special. It's a time capsule. It's mm. a, it's an emotional, it unlocks a vault sometimes in us emotionally that we haven't been able to unlock before. Mm -hmm. is, is music still a part of your life, even though if you're not playing it? like Yeah, it's still in our household. My wife's quite musical, so she plays a bit of piano and guitar and um, daughter's learning instruments at school. And, yeah, so it's still present. And, you know, they've got a bit of an idea on who Dad was. and um, They're going to have an idea once, they, well, once they're able to read it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? They're yeah. not going to, they'll be like, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it'd be like, you know, we actually, we had an opportunity once. I remember Watto, our manager, came backstage. I don't know where we were. Watto goes, you, do you want to meet the guitarist from Aerosmith? And um, we we're like, yeah, yeah, great. Bring him back. Anyway, he came in, but he brought his son. I think he might've been like 12 or 13 and he was a Silver Joe fan. And it was funny to see, I don't know if you remember this, but his oh, son- it rings a bell. He was a bit he, embarrassed. He was embarrassed of his dad, <laughs> who was- <laughs> Joe <laughs> fucking Perry. Yeah. <laughs> was it Joe Perry? I oh, think that, it was whoever the other guitarist yeah. was. Yeah, oh, the other one. Uh, Tom Todd, the bass player. I can't remember the other guitar player's name. But it, anyway, the, the, it was funny to see like, dude, like your old man is in a legendary band, but yeah. he was like, it was still his dad. And he was like, oh, dad. dad. Oh, dad. So embarrassing. Yeah, get in there and get the oh, phone. Yeah. 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 So that, that that's like you know where that's that's yeah. coming. It's and coming. It's coming. Oh, it is yeah. coming. Like, gee, but oh, it's good to talk about Bachelor again. <laughs> like, I know, but that's perfect. It's all a part of it. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of looking forward to that. Yeah, it's it, who you are. It's all a part of you yeah. know trying to separate yourself from your parents, which you know, as you become an an identity of yourself, which you describe in the book quite wonderfully as the first tour after you were eighteen when it was like yeah. We've arrived. Yes. We're here. Yeah. Back in three months. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right. We got this. And I guess the moment that you guys had where you had to actually sit down with your folks and go, actually, the fan club thing that you've been running, which is, I think, one of the real keys when I look at the way that your band is, the real key that you guys unlocked was that, mm. was that connection to your community and the nurturing of your audience in a way that other bands in Australia, at least, were not doing. Yeah. And look, the and time. the mums facilitated a really wonderful portal for that and they did an amazing job and they were extremely dedicated Yeah, um, because it took... It wasn't digital format back then. It was stuffing envelopes and yeah. analog, putting stamps on, and it was, yeah. Um, so there was hours and hours of their yeah. time. There's yeah. no MailChimp where you hit go. Yeah. No. no. But, yeah, they're, they're definitely it, – it just – I guess in that moment, it, well, it was no disrespect to them either. It was just, okay, cool, I, I think we just – Will we can just give us the full reins and it's fine. Yeah. It's no disrespect. It was just sort of trying to bring it into just the three of us um, yeah. internally. I think it was also an element there. It just wasn't. It was getting more expensive, and trying to keep it all going. It had to go towards that sort of more digital yeah. way. That's where things were going. 
And I think at that point, like I think it's we mentioned in the book, we were twenty seven. Yeah, it was time that we you know, just took responsibility like just, for. Yeah, we just it was it was it, it was our band. You know, we yeah. wanted to run it how we wanted to run it. Because the business side of things, as we've discussed, the business side of things is the stuff that people don't really talk about. But as you clearly pointed out, that's the thing that keeps the bands together. Mm. Is if there's a good structure, that's how the music gets kept, keeps getting made. That's how people keep can get on tour. You know, David Lee Roth, David Lee Roth, famous had the amazing the the brown M and M's, which is my my favourite ever writer story. I and know it's coming. I yeah. still use it. I still use it all the time. I use it with Zamet just mm. the other day. So there's a few too many brown M and M's with this you know, this other project that I'm on, um, nothing to do with him. Um, and <laughs> the, the brand name is for people who don't know, that was one of their outrageous rider things, but right. they were touring PAs and lights that were bigger than anyone had ever done. And they had some mm. real safety problems. They had things falling out of ceilings. They had PAs falling over stages that couldn't handle the weight. And so in the middle of the like page 27 of a 40 page thing, uh, when Van Halen came to play at your stadium, it said, uh, we need hundred amp breakers. We need this many security per people. We need a uh, stage that can harry this much. We need a bowl backstage with no brand name names. We need this many things. We this, blah, blah, blah. And so that way, if they walk backstage and they saw the bowl, they went, we're not going on stage because we have to check that it's safe. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was a freaking cool, cool idea. <laughs> was there something that you guys, like business-wise, that you put together, you're like, we're freaking glad we did that? Um, I mean, I thought you were leaning into the rider question there. I mean, you can tell me about that. I mean, in yeah, that 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 is really clever. Actually, yeah. that is a really clever. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Did they read the memo? Yeah. Did they? Yeah. yeah how much? De did they? How much detail did they go to that to put this together? It. That's yeah. a great idea. Mm. Yeah. Um, I use that one day. Yeah, that's really. Um, in terms of writers, <laughs> <laughs> I do remember we added right. socks. Ah. Yeah, we realized very early on that um, socks were an important part of touring life and we noticed when we went to truck stops that you why could... why were socks i'm not what sure what were you doing with your socks <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't doing what you were doing well i never ran out of socks look if, if oh, the bus is rocking <laughs> yeah don't come and knock <laughs> hey Gillies, what's that rabbit doing in your bunk <laughs> <laughs> look i don't know why but for some reason like it was it was more it was easier just to throw socks out and just because at truck stops, for some reason, they had these huge packs of like 30 socks. Yeah. So we put socks on the rider. So every every place you went to, you just grabbed a, you know. Fresh pair of socks. Fresh pair of socks. Because you could stretch a pair of jeans and a t-shirt out. For a few days. You yeah. know, to next laundry day. Yeah. yeah. Socks after a gig. Yeah. It was nah. e easy to throw them in the bin. Look, it was a little wasteful, I'm sorry. But, you know, for, for, the, for the recycling, you know, not great. <laughs> but... You know, it was easy to throw them in the bin and you, you know you've got a fresh, fresh deck ready to go. <laughs> well, look, you know, athlete's foot has kept many a band off the road. Yep. You know, That's right. Hygiene and, you know, it's, it's, I think Foo Fighters do socks and boxes. Yeah, right. right. Fresh pair of boxes for everyone in yeah. the band. Socks and jocks. Yeah. Look, it's safe to say that uh, athlete, jock, jock itch didn't get, uh, didn't bring silver chair down. <laughs> Hi, gig, yeah, yeah, old gig butt. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, yeah, I was just because I was just, the way that you, who, who you were, who you were to have someone like uh, you know John Watson, which you you referred to him as Watto, you know the industry legend, mm. uh, to have that person guiding you through were the things that perhaps he did or moves that he made that you went and in hindsight you're like that was freaking. Look, I, I think there was a lot of stuff that he did that we were unaware of. And um, like the, the mention of the, the M&Ms, I think he was that guy. Mm -hmm. He was the M&Ms guy that was kind of had a had an eye over everything. John and, and Mel as well, who worked at our management, um, yeah. those guys were just, we just had so much trust in him. And, you know, I'd say Watto and Mel and, and the team that, you know, they're, they're arguably probably one of the best in the industry, Australian mm -hmm. industry ever. So to have them in our corner and we just trusted them so much that, you know, we didn't need the bowl of brown M&Ms, you know, because yeah, we knew- those guys were there. Yeah. yeah. They were just they were just so good at what they did and made sure everything- Actually, Watto um, and Mel would all gen, um, often get upset with us because they put so much time into- We always had like a tour booklet and itinerary with like- major detail well, on day to day. on every day, yeah. And then, you know, some days we'd call up going like, hey guys, what's what, happening what, today? What, what are we doing? What, what's, what's going on today? <laughs> and what I would be like, 
oh, do you guys even look at these <laughs> books that we spend <laughs> like weeks. countless weeks and hours working on for you? And it was just, just look at the bloody book. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. It's all there. <laughs> the tour Bible. The tour yeah. Bible. Ring yeah. down tour Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Things yeah. to do in each city. Yeah. It's a 200 meter walk to a museum. Pretty yeah. much. Go and do it. Yeah. Sound checkers mm. this time. <laughs> yeah. Here's your contact details. Here's this is your the promo interviews. That's on that Here's day. Every, yeah. Everything was there and was like, hey, what are, what are we doing today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, well, it's, it's good that you guys, you know, I'm sure that relationship meant that when it, Came time for your folks to go off tour. They felt okay that you guys, yeah, were and, and also the crew that we'd established as well. Like yeah. it was a pretty tight knit little um, group. Yeah, um, yeah. No, and like it was just one big traveling family. Really, what's the key to holding that kind of uh, like a, t- a tour, a touring party of techs and you know people like that? It, it's you're just road warriors. You're in each other's. You exist in this universe, this bubble that Pretty only exists much, within yeah. you. You yeah. know, you're you're two vans loaded of people in black t-shirts that work on a different time scale to the rest of the planet mm. for months at a time. What's the key to keeping something like that together and not getting each other's just not getting on each other's tits? You, I think you learn where people's boundaries are really yeah. quickly. Like if someone needs a, a moment to themselves, you just go, just you can let them find space within this confined <laughs> ship, right? <laughs> that has no no doors, no yeah. windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you guys you guys are notorious for fucking with each other. Oh look, you know, yeah, <laughs> it was a sport, an art form, some would say. Yeah. Oh, this gentleman here was probably the best at it. Really. Look, right. I, I get pinned with it. I don't think it's completely true. I, everyone was involved. Yeah. You know? Who, I, who lit the match? Uh, <laughs> I lit a few matches. <laughs> I, I what, were you, what was like? What was some of your more elaborate uh, capers? Just was, persistent, probably. Yeah. Probably like, you know, like the hyena just hanging off the edge of the kill. Like, I'm going to, I'll get my dinner in a minute. If I just <laughs> keep, it's the law of averages, right? <laughs> I'll get it. I'll get it. <laughs> yeah, look, if someone if, if someone if there was a if there was a moment of weakness that that wasn't, you know, that wasn't going to hurt anyone's feelings or be nasty, you know, that could be a fu- it was all about a laugh. It was all about a laugh. Yeah. And if there was a moment and I saw it, I I, I would like to uh, you know, you know, take Shine the opportunity, you know, to to it's all about getting a laugh. If you got a laugh, <laughs> pursue. Just what was what was the one that had the like the, the the longest bow drawn? I'm talking like if not days, if not weeks, but like months before a payoff. Oh God, no, I, I I don't think there was that much thought put into it. Really no, it was, it was all instant, it was an instant gratification. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There was there was no real. I mean, maybe you know, uh, maybe Watto's the 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 boardroom for Watto. I. I don't oh want, yeah, the I birthdays thing yeah. did drag on a few years. I don't want to claim that that was all me. That was that was a collective but, inspired you know, by in, inspired by yeah. So Watto had um. Um, you know, probably I don't know. I don't know if we hit triple figures, but he had a lot of birthdays <laughs> a lot. Over, over, over only a that's... short amount of years. So <laughs> wherever we went, we just if we were at a restaurant, we just say, "Hey, look, it's our manager's birthday." <laughs> you know, can, <laughs> so, so what we 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 is particularly in America, we'd be, be hoping that it was like a kind of restaurant that will like Everyone you know six dances would come out and a cake. <laughs> that's what we'd be praying for, and it did happen a few times. <laughs> and you get it in Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> when the back of house crew come out. <laughs> yeah. But he was a good sport. He was, know? yeah. You know, well, he, we got free dessert every time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the boardroom one did take, it, like it was. Yeah, a bit more planning went into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We convinced him that there was this really important meeting that. <laughs> was it Epic <laughs> HQ yeah, in, in New York? New York. <laughs> the record company. Yeah. yeah. Not a small building. Not a small the place building. That, the, the Walter Yetnikoff H, it's like. Yeah. The, the room, the building that Walter Yetnikoff wrote about in his book, that's the Michael Jackson signed his contract in the fucking yeah, room. Yeah, that's probably the yeah. same room. Same yeah, room. Yeah, yeah, So we, we convinced Watto that there was that we were having a big meeting in there. He got um, all dressed up for yeah, it. Yeah, got put in his best shirt. Little did he know that <laughs> um, we'd organised a uh, special dancer for his birthday and we had, and I think we had some cream pie. Big fat cream pie in the face. What more could you ask for? 
I don't even know why we did it to him. We just it Watto did become a target for a, a lot of our a lot of our jokes. Actually, even one I remember one time in uh, Germany. You might remember this. He we were a bit younger, and and he and he, he he was nice enough to give us his hotel room and say, "Boys, have have a bit of space away from your parents. Use my room. You can watch like some telly and just chill out." You know. Anyway, we went into his room. We're like. Right, what can we do here? So we basically like we just anything electronic, we just kind of made it not work. <laughs> and then we um I think we short shielded his bed. <laughs> so you know, yeah. for I don't think a lot of people know what that is, but you kind of when you get into your bed, there's no way for your legs to go. <laughs> um but then I think that we even got some chocolate and we melted oh, the chocolate. That's right. All and the we toilet. S- we smeared it over the inside of the toilet bowl and kind of just left it sitting in there. <laughs> So when he got back to his room, he was like, you know, this, ho- this hotel, this hotel is atrocious. Like <laughs> he's complaining down. They can't, they can't make beds. <laughs> Nothing works in the room, and someone's <laughs> taking a shit, and then they've left the remnants. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little bit of planning that went into that. Yeah, but it's all it's a way of telling someone that you think about them. That's right. Yeah, we care. It, it, was we a, care. it was a big yeah. fat thank you. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. That's so lovely. We wouldn't have done that if we didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> to to do a book like this, is this allow you to I mean, fuck it, it's a terrible metaphor, but is it does it allow you to kind of like go, you know, close the book and just go, there's a chapter that is we can now move, we feel okay that this has all been said and now we can walk walk on from here? Um there's definitely a sense of comfort. Knowing that it's all there in one place, yeah. Um, I feel definitely a lot more comfortable having reliving a lot of it and telling the story. Um, you know, there were some uncomfortable moments, um, and um, I definitely feel there yeah, more at ease with it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's life's it, the story. It just stops there because that's where well, it's just where we're up to. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. And tell me about, like, you have the life you have because you created something that people wanted, all right? And people wanted it so much, they saved up, they bought the CD, they bought a ticket, they followed you, they bought, they showed up at every tour. What would you have to say, looking back on the relationship with the people that loved the music you made, the fans? I think we were, and still are actually, just complete, really blessed for the fans mm. because they um, they were willing to go on a, mu- a musical journey with us because we changed a lot uh, because obviously we had a we had a lot to learn as well and grow as artists um, but they've just been incredibly loyal mm. you know and you know some even quite fanatical you know like just so invested in the band and I always I always look at the fans as like if it wasn't for them we wouldn't have had the career that we it's like for any artist you know if if you don't have fans if you don't have people that follow what you do and are passionate about what you do like it's it's just a hobby you know um so I think we we're incredibly fortunate to have um people that were just you know, came along the journey mm-hmm. with us, and it was so they—they they were just so support. They were, they were fucking awesome. They yeah. are fucking awesome. Mm. To have you—you you mentioned it, but what, what is it, what does it feel like to be on the literally the other side of the world where you are communicating by pointing at a picture of ramen or something <laughs> and hearing someone <laughs> sing a song that you guys wrote back at you from the stage? What's that feel like? Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's it's incredible, um, and. I I reckon there's, you know, undoubtedly moments that we just probably completely missed because you're just in the eye of the storm and it's all going so fast and probably, you know, and that book's been good to stop and reflect and have have a whole new appreciation for lots of stuff that that happened and we did and experienced. Yeah. Smell the roses. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> dirty socks oh, or, dirty, or dirty socks and roses is work for me and it's like yeah. it's really it, it's like you know hey honey I got you a CD you didn't pay for it it's not a present <laughs> I, can't, I can't bring roses home yeah. oh yeah <laughs> doesn't work anymore doesn't yeah. work to, to like I know we started with this but you know what does it mean that you've got each other um 
Well, for me, I take great comfort in someone else knows a lot of what I went through and experienced, and that's there's um, we can probably relate to each other uh, in a deeper way than probably other friendships and not discounting those friendships, but it definitely just, it's just a little bit different. Yeah. It was interesting when, because Chris and I did have a, a little bump in the road there for a while. A dry we, spell. A dry spell. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but as I think, uh, I think Carissa, um, Chris's partner described it really well that I think, um, who we've also become really close with, Jackie and my wife and I. And she said when, because she hadn't seen Chris and I together, um, that when we kind of reconnected and rekindled that friendship, she made a comment saying, oh, I've never seen Chris like this with anybody else. There's, they've just got this unspoken thing that they just get each other on that deeper level. And I guess we, mm. again, it's our reality. We don't see it. Yeah. But... Um, it, it's just such a, it is a special thing to, to be able to have an experience, you know, and I think, I kind of think that's what a lot of us chase, you know, mm, in yeah. life is to have those relationships. So it's, you know, you, again, you just gotta, you gotta be thankful that, that we're, that we're able to have that. And I think what you also said before about writing those experiences down of, of, you know, growing up at that time in Australia and yes, you're having these quite magnified experiences, but they're the same thing that people are going through. I felt way less alone reading what you guys have been through. Mm. Going like, well, it wasn't in Brazil, and it wasn't, but I, yeah. I, I can, relate to, you can relate to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, you feel like, oh, it's not just me. Yeah. And it's a really nice feeling. Yeah. You know? It's a real gift you guys have given mm. us, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming around. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs>